and welcome to season two of Digital Mental Health Musings coming to you from Tarabal and Yagara country. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Tanya McMahon, and I'm really excited about our guests today because they come from one of the longest standing digital mental health services in Australia, if not the longest standing. And that service is Lifeline, which a lot of you are likely already very familiar with. So today we're going to get a bit of a backstage pass to Lifeline and get to know its story, what its role is and where it kind of fits in the digital landscape and ultimately how you as a health practitioner can use it as a tool in your patient care. And I'm also really excited about this chat today because Lifeline is a really fabulous example of how digital services have rapidly evolved and adapted, especially in the past five, five or so years to really meet the needs of Australians. And we'll be hearing more about how Lifeline has done that in today's episode. So today we have two guests. We have Sherry Cameron, who's the National Manager of Digital Services for Lifeline Australia, with the digital services being 24-7 support to people in distress via SMS and online chat. Now, this service went from being a six-hour-a-night pilot program to a 24-7 operation using hundreds of trained volunteers, all working remotely. So this was an incredible scaling up of the service, and it was Sherry who oversaw it. Now, Sherry's an MBA and also holds an advanced degree in psychology, is a licensed counsellor, and she's really passionate about bringing balance to the mental health and social services sector with responsible business practices and conscious leadership. Uh, So we're really pleased to have you, Sherry. Welcome. Thank you so much, Tanya. I really appreciate the intro and look forward to the discussion today. And today we also have Tess Riddle. And Tess is a lead practice facilitator at Lifeline Australia, providing trauma-informed and evidence-based guidance to the Lifeline phone and digital crisis support services. She is a social worker by education, has given support to people from asylum seeker backgrounds, and is really passionate about collaboration with stakeholders when it comes to creating meaningful and sustainable changes Uh, within support services. So we'll be really excited to hear how this kind of collaboration has played out in the evolution of Lifeline's services. Um, So welcome, Tess. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Tanya. It's great to be here. Yeah, Sherry and I are really excited. So to get us started, I know I've introduced you both, but I'd love to hear um, maybe just briefly in your own words um, about your roles at Lifeline, what you do, and, and maybe what you like most about your role. I'll jump in and start us off. Um, so as um, the national manager of the digital services, I oversee and, and look after um, a combination of people, um, partly being our volunteers that we train, that we rely on so heavily, um, that provide the crisis support to the public that contact us. Also, a large group of uh, what we call in-shift support supervisors. So those are the people who support those um, volunteers. And then we do have some of our centers providing the service and and we support those centers in providing those roles. Um, And really what um, is most exciting to me about the role is the huge amount of transformation and change that's occurring in this space. So, you know, as as many of us can relate to, you know, we used to um, have landlines and answering machines, and and now, um, you know, the particularly the younger generation is just not that likely to pick up a phone and have a voice call. So, in the digital space, we we have so many opportunities with technology and advancements in in artificial intelligence and stuff to to continue to offer crisis support to the public in in many different ways and in ways that they prefer to to have us uh, speak to them or communicate with them. So I'm really excited about the future and all the things that we can do in this space um, in the coming years. 
Well, yeah, I guess Tanya's given a great little intro um, for me too, but just, you know, maybe to provide a bit more background and context. So um, I work in what's called the clinical practice team at Lifeline Australia. So I work really closely with, with Sherry, but our team's kind of made up of people from different clinical or mental health backgrounds. So I'm a social worker, but other members of the team are psychologists, um, counsellors. We've had mental health nurses work in the team before. So we've really been, I suppose, employed to provide that um, clinical or, or mental health kind of expertise, despite Lifeline being a non-mental health or um, non-clinical service, but we're there to just kind of inform the delivery um, of the service to ensure it's, you know, safe and, and meeting um, those kinds of requirements to ensure we're supporting people um, in the best way that we can. And so our role is really kind of diverse. We um, support the people delivering the crisis support services. So as Sherry indicated, um, you know, in her team and in her role, she um, works with, you know, different levels of crisis support staff. So we're doing the same, but our support, I suppose, is through things like training development, policy and procedure writing. We provide other kinds of professional development, both direct and indirect support um, across all the levels of the crisis support services on the phone and the digital platforms. Um, so 13, 11, 14, as I'm sure many of the listeners are familiar with, but then text and chat too. Um, but we also service Lifeline Australia, so our head office. So we're supporting the teams there like marketing and fundraising, um, I suppose, to ensure that any material that's public facing on the website or when we have promotions or um, big events, they're being um, described or promoted in, in safe ways. Um, so communications out to the public are checked through us. And yeah, so it's a very diverse role. And I think that's probably what excites me and what I enjoy. No day is the same and um, using my kind of clinical skills in a very different way, but still in a meaningful one with, you know, very far reaching impact. Fantastic. And Sherry, can you tell us briefly about the history of Lifeline as, you know, a crisis support service and kind of how, how it became established? Well, Lifeline, as, as I'm sure most people know, is, is really kind of what I refer to as a heritage brand. Um, the uh, organizer or the, the founder of it started over, I think 50, we're going to be celebrating our 60th uh, anniversary next year. So it, it, it started with you know, an individual who saw the need to support the public in, in their time of need. And over the years, it, uh, it it's expanded and, and we have um, centers and networks throughout um, Australia from very small centers to very sophisticated centers providing a variety of services. So each center has their own product offering. So many of them support the 13, 11, 14 um, number and uh, provide those voice services. And then many also have the the retail outlets, the book fairs, lots of things that, that everyone's familiar with. So particularly over the last couple of years, um, we've seen extraordinary demand on the services. And so um, I, I would really say that in the last few years through the, through the COVID experience, Lifeline has really stepped up and really um, innovated in order to be able to meet the demand of the Australian public during this time. So um, we've really been able to expand um, the number of crisis supporters that we have available on both the phones and the digital services. Mm -hmm. So it really sounds like these kind of humble beginnings and a, you know, a service with a very simple aim and goal that it's really flourished and grown and, and adapted and evolved. And particularly, as you said, in the pen with the pandemic, really pivoting to, to meet the, the changing needs of Australians. Sherry, can you tell us a bit more about that, how Lifeline has kind of evolved over time in terms of what, what does it offer today? How, and how did, you know, those services come about? Well, if you look at the Lifeline logo and you see all of the, the dots, what that logo is, is actually the receiver of an old telephone um, headset. And so the, the beginnings were really about a phone line and someone being there 
uh, for somebody in crisis during their 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 darkest times and answering the phone. Um, and Lifeline has really built its foundation on that. And that is what we would consider our our core offering is the voice. And, and we do offer that in different ways. So we've uh, recently launched what we're calling 13 Yan, which is a service for um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. So it is a phone line which is um, staffed by and serviced uh, for that community. And then we also have had phone lines for you know, the bushfires and, and other events that come up. So we adapt and change as the, the need of the community does. And as that has grown, um, the Lifeline Network has expanded into what we consider community services. So some of our centers will offer face-to-face -face counseling. Some of them, um, like I referred to, have the retail shops. A lot of them are very involved in their local communities. And, and again, we have those from very small mom and pop centers to, to, to very sophisticated organizations that, that have a wide range of uh, products and services for, for their communities. Yeah, and just to kind of further that, I suppose, um, you know, that evolution over time, like within Lifeline, you know, um, uh, Sherry um, and yourself, Tanya, indicated at the beginning, the growth and expansion of the digital service, you know, that was really in a, you know, effort to better meet the needs. Um, what we were understanding was happening for people at the time. We know some people prefer to text or chat than they do to, to talk on the phone. Or, you know, as Sherry indicated, depending on the, the local community centre, they're going to better understand the needs of their community. So face-to-face -face counselling, but also a lot of training, um, education kind of programs um, are run out of those specific um, centres. Um, and, you know, we in, in the head office will, you know, support that as best we can. And so we're really about um, best meeting the needs of the communities in those specific areas at, at that time and, and doing our best to kind of expand or evolve um, to meet those needs. Yeah, and Tess, you really bring up a, a really valid uh, area that I, I did <laughs> um, forget to mention is the training. We have a very robust training uh, department that is is done through the centers. So centers do a lot of training. But we as, as Lifeline, um, we look at all the training that we do for our volunteers as um, a community service. So when they go through the training, be it for the digital service or for the phones, we feel as if we're, we're giving them valuable skills and, and tools to use in their families, their schools, their local communities. So even when they're not volunteering for Lifeline, we feel as if we're, we're adding value to the community with, with that training that they get. Yeah, and I think it's also important, you know, another kind of um, area of expansion, it's probably particularly relevant for the, you know, practitioners and, and services listening today is that we've also kind of identified a fourth avenue of support. So we've got the voice, um, you know, the text and the chat. But there's also like what we're kind of calling digital in the sense of like online information seeking. So our website um, as another way. So some people might not necessarily want to connect directly with a crisis supporter and, and engage with with a person but it might just be about learning a little bit more about how I'm feeling or maybe you're worried about someone and with our website we're you know evolving that currently and updating it um but in in order to meet the needs of the community because we've kind of seen that's another way people get support is just learning more and information seeking fantastic so it really sounds like like Lifeline is is trying to really understand the needs of Australians and meet them where they're at, whether that's, you know, it started with the phone service and then you've got the face-to-face, -face, um, we've got training for, for you know, uh, practitioners to, you know, and and the community to help them support others. Um, and now we've got the, the crisis um, chat and text and now, and also information, I guess the information resources that are on the Lifeline website. So it really sounds like, you know, Lifeline's really aware of the changing needs and people's preferences and where they're finding information and where they're finding support and trying to, um, you know, fill in all those, fill in all those gaps. It's not just 
the phone service, which I think a lot of people are probably familiar with because that's that's the one part of the service that's been around so long. And that that's um, fascinating too to hear about the information resources on the website, you know, realizing that Lifeline is, I guess, a bit of an authority in the area and, you know, supporting people in these, um, uh, with these issues and, you know, having credible, trustworthy um, information available when, where people are going to go find it, you know, on the, on the website rather than say Dr. Google <laughs> instead. Mm-hmm. Um, that's mm-hmm. really, that's really fantastic that, that it, you know, it really is more than just the phone service. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, uh, maybe Sherry, tell us a little bit more about maybe the crisis um, chat and text service? Cause possibly a lot of our um, listeners might not necessarily be aware of those offerings, um, you know, that, that they've evolved in the, in the past few years. Can you tell us a little bit about how they came to be? Yeah, well, and that's a really good point, um, Tanya, is that with um, our digital services, so both the SMS and the online chat, um, we do tend to run quite quietly. You see the the 13, 11, 14 number on lots of bus stops and on the end of lots of uh, television uh, programs, but with the digital service, um, we kind of run quietly. So we we don't advertise a lot and we don't promote our service a lot because we basically run at capacity without any promotion. So word of mouth. Um, We started a few years ago with just a a small pilot um, testing some theories and some uh, opinions that we had on whether the service was viable or not. And that resulted in a a couple of research papers and uh, presentations that really validated the need for the service um, within Australia, um, looking at um, some international best practices and such. And so we've uh, taken it from that pilot program and, again, somewhat fueled by the the COVID um, pandemic, we we stood the product up from a six-hour a night uh, to 24 seven in just a little over 12 months. So that was quite quite the accomplishment um, in, in training and supporting uh, the resources to get that done. And we um, now, like I said, we, we kind of run at capacity. What we do know is that about 70% of our demand is between the hours of 8 p.m and 6 a.m. So we, we're we certainly an evening and uh, nighttime service. Um, not that we don't have uh, people contacting us during the day, but the demand is highest um, during those hours. And some of the unique things that we find with the digital is that um, because it can be done um, you know, on a bus, at school, um, sitting next to a spouse on the couch. Um, we we find that we're supporting individuals in, in very different environments than perhaps they would be on, on a, a, a voice call because they're not going to be overheard. Um, so we, we know that the digital service does skew younger so we, we do have um, a younger population reaching out to us. Uh, the other interesting thing that came out of the research is that 43% of the people involved in the initial study said that they would not reach out to a crisis support um, service that was voice, that they would only be willing to reach out in a digital um, manner. And I think that that is, is partly just the nature of changed in in the world and people being more comfortable uh, typing, but also there's um, a a bit more, I guess, uh, privacy in in the digital service. Um, You know, our our crisis supporters that are, are helping the public don't necessarily have a lot of information on the person who's, who they're, communicating with. Um, you know, we're we're an anonymous service. So unless the, the person chooses to tell us their age or or tell us any factors, we really don't 
know some of the cues that you would get on the voice. You know, you would hear a a male or a female voice or a younger voice or an older voice. Um, so that that makes it um, interesting for our crisis supporters. Mm, I think that um, that anonymity um, really appeals to a lot of people, and I think that's so wonderful about this. You know, the 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 chat and text offering is that people's preferences are changing in a different, and that's so you know fascinating that that stat about almost half of them wouldn't have reached out otherwise. So that's almost half of those those uh, consumers who possibly otherwise wouldn't have gotten help were it not for that option. Um, and interesting too about the t- the time of day. Uh, you know, the, you're saying it's obviously available, but you know, it's very much a, a nighttime service. It, people's preferences for how they get support also change depending on the time. That maybe during the day someone might feel comfortable calling or um, or, or whatever, but at night they they kind of want that maybe more intimate or anonymous or, or, or whatever mm-hmm. option. So um, it's really fantastic that it's really meeting people's needs um, and changing and evolving needs. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's where we are today with what Lifeline offers. Um, where do you both see Lifeline kind of fitting in Australia's digital mental health landscape? So like, what do you see as its role? You know, what what is it and what isn't it? Um, I think it's a really, yeah, interesting question. And I suppose the first thing, first thing to say um, for me about it's probably what we're not. So I think where Lifeline, um, you know, kind of fills a gap or is different is we're not a mental health service. Um, so our role is quite different to other services, for example, like Beyond Blue or um, Black Dog Institute or, or other services such as that. So whilst we, you know, provide, and Sherry spoke to it before, like really robust training to the the staff delivering the service to the crisis supporters and and their supervisors and such, they're still volunteers um, and not trained mental health professionals. So I think it's really important just to differentiate our service from um, other mental health services. So our offering is really there to provide that connection and to listen and support someone, not in a non-judgmental way in that moment. And so, you know, the um, anonymity that um, you were both just speaking to for the digital um, service of text and chat, that's also still true for voice. So whilst, you know, you could identify the voice of someone, you know, we don't ask for people's names. It's one off crisis support. So each time you reach out to the service, there's no history of previous contacts to the service um there's you know no record of your call so even if you call multiple times you can be assured that you're not going to be treated um or, or remembered in a, in a way from last time um and, and i think that makes people feel safe and that they can trust the service that each time they're they're treated in the in that present moment that it's like how they're feeling today or tonight is how they're going to get that support. Um, but I think that is also important for, you know, the people listening today to be aware of, like we don't offer continuity of care or um, any kind of um, follow-up um, or support, but that we're not mental health professionals and our offering is very much to support that person in a collaborative way in that moment of crisis, whatever that crisis kind of looks like for that person. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Tess, because um, I think that because Lifeline does have such a a broad reach, people um, are not always aware um, of of the services that that we do offer and that that kind of one off um, crisis support is really is really the focus. And I think that um, to carry that forward, I think that Lifeline has an opportunity to um, offer that, that type of support uh, to a broader and broader audience um, in the future with with you know new technology and new training. I think that Lifeline um, has uh, many opportunities in the future to be there uh, for people in their time of crisis and mm-hmm. and hopefully provide um, a safe space for them to uh, become secure and safe in that moment and then be able to seek the help that they need um, further on. So um, with, with true professionals. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is a big part of our role is then linking and connecting people um, with other supports, whether that be, 
you know, digital or, or face-to-face, but it's very much done in, in collaboration with the person. Um, but yeah, I suppose I think your original question, Tanya, sorry if we kind of went a little bit um, tangential there, but I suppose where Lifeline fits in the kind of digital mental health landscape, I guess we've kind of spoken about like our website offering or, you know, the expansion of the text and chat service from that digital lens. Um, but I'd say those are the three kind of main areas we fit um that it's just important to differentiate our offering from others that are more clinical or or mental health focused sure yeah so it really sounds like that main role is that that one-off crisis support that containment not with someone who's a you know fully qualified mental health professional but just someone who's had training to listen non-judgmentally be there for that person in that moment help them get through that Mm. moment and then obviously the referral options and, you know, getting through the up to further support. It's not a, an ongoing clinical care kind of, kind of option. It's, it's really that, you know, the definition of crisis support. Exactly. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm kind of keen to get into a few little details here um, because we really find uh, it helps uh, for health practitioners you know, when they're referring patients, clients to these services Uh, really helps them to speak really confidently about the services when they know exactly what's going to happen for the patient or the the client uh, when they, when they contact, Um, it kind of takes away some of the mystery. Um, Can you talk us, you know, briefly through what individuals can expect to experience when they pick up the phone, when they contact Lifeline, you know, uh, when they, you know, go for phone, online chat and the SMS, what can they experience um, when they go to do that? Well, Tess, I'll take the digital part and I'll let you talk to the voice, okay? But um, in the digital space, um, obviously we have the online chat, which is accessed through our website, and then the SMS, which uh, there's a number that uh, you can text. And in both those instances, the the first thing that will happen is that you'll get a a welcome message um, informing you that you've you've reached out to Lifeline and that uh, we've connected with you. And then um, there's an option for a a very short, um, I guess what we consider a a pre-conversation. So while they're waiting, they they go into a queue and while they're waiting, um, we um, give them the opportunity to give us a few demographic questions, age, state, things like that. If if they choose, they can opt out for those. Um, and, and some of the reasons for those um, are really important to uh, research, funding, understanding, you know, who's reaching out to us. And also in the event that we do need to reach out to emergency services, we, we have some information. Um, but again, all of that is optional. So once um, they're placed in the queue, they choose to either um, answer those or not. And then a, a crisis supporter uh, will pick up that message and they will introduce themselves and, and generally ask how they can help. And then from that point forward, the, the, the two um, have a conversation via the keyboard. Um, the interesting thing is that you know, online chat being over the internet is very quick and uh, spontaneous. Where with the SMS, um, there is a a slight delay between messages. If you think about texting a, a friend or family, you send the text; it has to go through the the telcos and and back. So we find that the the SMS conversations are a little slower than the online chat. Um, but basically, our crisis supporters work through uh, a framework that we train them in um, with the crisis, um, with the person reaching out to us for help. And once the conversation comes to uh, a natural conclusion, they'll wrap up and close the conversation. Um, At any point during um, the time with us, uh, they're instructed that they can type finish. And if they type finish, that is like a that's an end of the conversation. We do not continue. We will not ask any further questions. And that's for for two reasons. One, obviously privacy and, and people's choice, but also if they're in a in a situation where 
it's unsafe for them to continue. Um, we we know that that's a, a trigger just to uh, stop the conversation. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. <laughs> Tess, over to you. Yeah. Well, I suppose the kind of general overarching premise is the same for the phone um, service, but it's just a slightly different um, modality. So, you know, the person would dial 13, 11, 14, um, they would be connected to the IVR, so the um, integrated voice recording. So they'd be presented with, um, you know, some options to learn more about um, policies and procedures if they chose to. Um, and they'd be informed that they, you know, arrived in the queue and that they'd be connected shortly to a crisis supporter. Um, then they'll listen to some hold music, which has recently been updated, um, which is, you know, exciting. And um, then they would be connected with a crisis supporter who, as Sherry indicated, you know, they would um, ask how the person was going and, and what they were looking for in, in terms of support and follow the same framework that Sherry referenced. Um, so all crisis supporters are trained um, in the same way, but obviously the skills um, are slightly nuanced um, online versus over the phone, but ultimately it's the same, you know, type of support following that, you know, non-judgmental kind of demonstrating empathy and respect and really collaborating with that person in the here and now um, is our real kind of focus. And then, yeah, depending on what that looked like for the person, um, some potential referrals um, and discussing next steps and as appropriate kind of wrap up the, the phone call and, and that would be that. Fantastic. It's really helpful to hear, hear that because, you know, well, for a lot of people who maybe never contacted a service like Lifeline before, there's that kind of mystery. And for some people that might even be a, a you know, a deterrent for, you know, for, for contacting. Cause oh, I don't know what's, you know, is someone just pick up and say, hello, you know, what happens? So I think that really helps unravel some of the, the mystery about it. And that, you know, there's, you know, the optional demographics and that they've got, you know, this music and they've got the, you know, the mm. message they listen to um, this kind of lead into it. I think really knowing that process can help health, you know, health practitioners in um, demystifying it a bit and and um, encouraging people to to use the service. Yeah. And I'd just like to say too, Tanya, sorry, I didn't yeah. mention, um, we kind of touched on it before, but <clears throat> it's still anonymous when people phone the service. So um, at the moment, we're not collecting demographics as um, the digital service does at the beginning. So we don't have that kind of pre-information collection. Um, and if we were to change that, though, you know, the the, um, the person would be informed at the beginning and it would always be optional. Um, and, yeah, we don't, you know, force them to share anything um, that they don't want to, such as their name or identifying information. Um, but in the event of an emergency, um, we would be gathering as much information as we could um, in order to, you know, keep that person safe or provide that information to emergency services if, if we needed that. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and it's good too to know about, you know, as, as people go, th you know, um, go through, like you were saying before, Sherry, um, with the option to leave the chat or, or or text right away because they know that, you know, some people need to, to leave immediately. So just, you know, knowing that really the, the user's kind of in, in control of the, the whole um, and, and can make, you know, really active choices throughout the whole experience. And the, you know, um, if they do decide to give their information with the, um, uh, the chat options, what that what that's used for, and why it's important. I think knowing these things can really help um, uh, encourage people to um, to engage. That's that's mm -hmm. fantastic. Another thing I wanted to really kind of get into details wise is you know a big part of our work at MPRAC is to give guidance to a whole range of health practitioners about how to really 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 utilize um, digital services in their patient care. And we obviously acknowledge that different health practitioners will have different roles. So some won't be fully clinically responsible for the patient's mental health care, but but they are in the perfect position to use digital services as a referral option. You know, people like nurses and pharmacists, physios, they're, they're you know, perhaps dealing with a physical health issue, um, but they're in such a great position for referral options. And then we've got health practitioners who are delivering mental health interventions and they are clinically responsible for the patient's mental health care. So that, that'd be, you know, mental health, GPs, psychologists, social workers, OTs, and so on. 
And their kind of role is really maybe integrating these digital tools to enhance the care they're delivering. So when it comes to this broad range of health practitioners utilizing Lifeline as a tool, what are some examples of ways they could do that? Uh, Maybe Tessa, you know, you might be best positioned to answer this one. Um, You know, practitioners using it as a referral, practitioners using it, you know, as almost like a blended care or integrating it into their care. What are some examples you can um, can give us about how they can utilize Lifeline as a tool? Yeah, I mean, I guess as you touched on, like it really depends on um, their role and their relationship with that person. So with that client um, or patient, I think will really depend on which aspect of Lifeline they utilize and in what way. But, you know, I would say that, you know, potentially um, utilizing our website um, for information and resources. So, you know, we've got a, a range of different levels of information, um, you know, that may be of use to their, their patients or clients around better understanding how they're feeling. Um, so we've got, you know, toolkits and, and information. There's um, further information on more appropriate services. So we have like a service finder or referral options that could be useful to use in a session or even encouraging um, their client to go and have a look at the website themselves to learn more. Um, Or even if their client or or patient is worried about someone, so they may not be the person um, experiencing, you know, distress or anxiety or or fear or worry, but they're worried about someone. We also have information like that on our website um, that can be really useful. But another example I could see is like in between sessions. Um, So more your mental health practitioners, I suppose, if they're particularly worried about, um, you know, a client or, or a patient, um, maybe part of the safe plan that they're creating is that if you're feeling in crisis or you're experiencing, you know, it may be suicidal thoughts or it may be more um, whatever that crisis looks like for that person. I think it's really important to call out crisis doesn't always mean suicide. Um, a crisis is a crisis is a crisis is kind of what we always say. So whatever that means to that person, you know, they could call Lifeline in between sessions um, to get that immediate support if they're not able to connect with their, you know, mental health practitioner for another week or or a couple of weeks. Um, I think, though, as we mentioned before, it is important for the listeners to know that Lifeline then wouldn't be able to update um, that mental health practitioner about, you know, the outcome of that service they received from Lifeline or provide any continuity of care. So it would be really important that the um, health practitioner, but also the help seeker or that, that client or patient was aware of that, um, that they wouldn't get that continuity of care. So yeah, I think there's a, a bunch of different ways that, um, you know, Lifeline could support your listeners, um, whether that be information and resources via our website or yeah, encouraging their clients and patients to use our crisis support services in between sessions. Fantastic. And what would you say some of the key benefits of doing that would be like what what have the clients the patients and the practitioners as well got to really gain from taking advantage of of lifeline in that way yeah I mean again I think it really depends on that you know particular person and their needs but you know in my previous role prior to working at lifeline I was working in a counseling position and I would you know encourage my clients to reach out to Lifeline. And I think it was um, in between our sessions, if they were feeling, you know, um, distressed or or having kind of a difficult time um, in between sessions. And I think it can really build up resilience. It can be part of their kind of coping strategies and build a sense of, you know, independence and kind of empower that person to, in that moment, I'm feeling, you know, I'm having thoughts of suicide or I am feeling really worried about, you know, my upcoming trial or, um, you know, my, my daughter at school who's still overseas and I don't know where they are or whatever it is. Um, you know, I think that then gives them tools and resources independent from those sessions with that mental health practitioner to seek out support independently and when they need it. I think that's a really lovely way of looking at it as a way of building coping skills and independence and agency outside of sessions, because as, um, as clinicians, that's essentially what, what we're trying to do, you know, longer term for them is, you know, help them become their own therapists and, and, and be able to um, find what they need when they do get into crisis and, and, and distress um, 
outside of therapy and down the track. And I really like that, you know, creating, uh, you know, um, a plan to use Lifeline as a way to deal with crisis, crises, of which, of course, are not always suicide, as you mentioned, you know, thing, you know, there's probably lots of uh, buildups of crises before someone even, you know, gets to, to that point where, you know, support. Exactly. Them, support and I someone. think we really see that, um, you know, that we see our role there in that suicide prevention space. So someone contacting us, experiencing a crisis, whatever that looks like for them in that moment, if they get support, feel heard and understood and, you know, are able to get that support in that moment that in a way prevents them from further escalating in the future or you know maybe becoming suicidal because they've gotten that support there so we see um you know us our service at lifeline and our offering really instrumental in the suicide prevention space just as it is suicidal crisis space absolutely and i think that's a really key point too that you make because i think because people often associate lifeline with you know, I'll call if I'm, you know, feeling suicidal, they they get to think that maybe that's the only reason I can call is if I'm suicidal, but actually no, suicide prevention is about <laughs> stepping in and giving the people the support they need to prevent it from reaching that point. Um, and, you know, having someone to sit there and listen non-judgmentally to, you know, oh, I'm missing my daughter who's overseas or, I'm, you know, I, you know, lost my job, you know, whatever the crisis is. And as you said, a crisis is a crisis is a crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, that goes a long way um, to preventing people from reaching that, that, that rock bottom point. Um, yeah, so think- we really hope that we can de-escalate a lot of that and, you know, support the public in in bringing down that anxiety or bringing down, um, you know, the distress that someone's feeling so that they can uh, continue to to function and and support themselves um, through through their day or week. Mm. Fantastic. Well, We've covered a lot today um, and we're we're just about out of time. Um, so I really hope that our listeners have come away today with a refreshed and updated perspective on who and what Lifeline is, um, what it can be for their patients and their clients. Are there any final thoughts uh, that either of you uh, would like to leave with our listeners before we wrap up? Well, I think from my my side um i would just like to thank everyone um for listening and for providing the very important services that you do to the to the public and and we at lifeline are very happy to be a a supporter of of that and um you know we just really appreciate the the huge amount of work that uh, the mental health professionals have been doing over the last few years so um we thank you for that. And we always want to be here uh, to be a supporting um, part of your practices. Yeah. And I just like to echo that. And I suppose in the context of, you know, we're all in this together post COVID, um, you know, we're very aware of the strain and pressure that's on, you know, both individuals and and health practitioners in this space at the moment um, from a resourcing and and, um, that kind of space. So we really hope that, you know, Lifeline is, is a um, support both to practitioners and to help seekers alike and, and that we're all in this kind of together um, with that common goal of, you know, supporting people in crisis and, and preventing suicide. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Sherry and Tess. We really appreciated your your knowledge and your insight. Um, so thank you. Thanks Our for pleasure. having us. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.